Uh, welcome, uh, welcome back from lunch. Um, I am uh, uh, very pleased to uh, start this afternoon's session with our keynote speakers. Um, and um, we are very grateful to HSBC, uh, not only, as you can see, being generous uh, sponsors for helping uh, us present this conference here in Sao Paulo uh, and around the world on live stream, um, but they have provided two uh, truly incredible speakers uh, for our uh, keynote lunch session. Uh, so this will be moderated by Roberto Rigabon. Um, you've seen him a couple times already, um, so we, we don't have to do another introduction. Um, but uh, Roberto, it's yours. Yes, so uh, let me just uh, go straight ahead. Uh, we will have uh, uh, two individuals that know uh, both Latin America and, and Asia tremendously. Uh, uh, first, uh, Andre uh, Loes is going to start. He's a chief economist for Latin America and HSBC. Uh, he has a very long history uh, uh, in, uh, in, in practice. Uh, from the academic point of view, he got the PhD in economics from the University of Paris. Then he came to Brazil to work in back uh, Bossano, uh, Simonsen, and then uh, uh, finally in Santander. And from there, he moved to HSBC. Um, he's uh, the current uh, director of economic affairs of the Brazilian Banks Federation. And we're very thankful for taking time of your very busy agenda Pleasure. to be here. Uh, the second speaker uh, is going to be Paul Mackle. Paul Mackle. Uh, he's the managing uh, director, and he's at HSBC Hong Kong. Uh, he has a tremendous experience on foreign exchange uh, uh, markets. Uh, he, he went to uh, the UK uh, and studied in the London School of Economics, one of my preferred schools ever, I'm telling you. It's one of the best places to give a seminar. They destroy uh, faculty like you have no idea. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the University of Edinburgh that uh, in economics has uh, one of the most uh, richest histories. So you study in two of my preferred places on earth, actually, so I, I, I envy you. Um, he has spent uh, uh, 15 years and, uh, and he's an expert on, uh, on, um, on, um, on Asia and a specific and foreign exchange markets. Uh, we will have a short presentation from both. Uh, first, uh, Andre and, and second, Paul. And hopefully this uh, uh, is complementary to what we have discussed today. And, uh, and then we can have a conversation. Is that OK, Andre? First. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much for your support and being here. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, MIT Sloan School, for the, the kind invitation. Uh, I am a LATAM specialist. So fortunately, I have my, my colleague, Paul, here, which is a uh, Malaysia and China especially, so I will focus more on LATAM. I'll try to divide this in half of the presentation, talking about LATAM and the other half talking about the relationship between LATAM and China. So um, the first thing I wanted to, to address, I'll, I'll walk, I prefer, um, is uh, the fact that Latin America, as you know, is a, uh, a region where, for which commodities are quite important, and that's why this relationship uh, uh, you would expect with China, uh, commodity-hungry China, is, is, is started to be so important over the last decades. Um, Latin is a diverse region, uh, though. Uh, you have the South America, South American countries, which are uh, uh, the typical uh, uh, Lat Latin American country you would expect to see very, very much commodity related, and you have Mexico and Central America. Um, the South American economies, they present a significant participation of commodities in their exports, and you have different kinds of commodities. We're talking about soft commodities for countries like Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil. We are talking metals for countries like Chile, Peru, uh, also Brazil in the case of iron ore. You are talking oil for countries like Venezuela, Colombia. Uh, Brazil now, uh, probably a little more important oil will be for Brazil. Uh, Mexico in the past, Argentina, as the shale gas uh, 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 reserves in Argentina starts to be developed. So uh, it's, very, it's very competitive in terms of commodities and it's very diverse. Um, Mexico is a manufacturing exporter and this stands out differently in the region. Uh, Mexico uh, 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 has established this trend after it has joined the NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Association. 
Uh, 20 years ago, Mexico used to be an economy much more dependent also of commodities. Uh, uh, in the case, it was oil. And then with the integration of, with the US, it became uh, 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 more, much more of a manufactured goods exporter. Um, you can see that on this chart, uh, on this table, sorry, all the participation of commodities in the exports of all the countries that we cover in the region is much bigger, uh, with the exception of uh, Mexico. So um, this is the importance, the, 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 the first thing you would, you would think about the importance of commodities for South American countries, particularly and in, in, in Latin America in general. But the commodities impact, they go, it goes beyond the trade balance. In the smaller countries of South America, when you think about Chile, about Peru, commodities also affect the broader economy in terms of the activity, the participation of commodities in, in the GDP is important directly and indirectly. Uh, fiscal accounts are also very much impacted by that, by the commodity swings. This chart on the left side shows the central government revenues in Chile, and the gray area is the, the mining-related revenues which are becoming lower with time, one of the reasons why we see potential GDP growth in Chile reducing, by the way. Uh, but it, it, it used it to be, and it still is, a very important part of uh, mining revenues. Um, what happens in the small, open, and commodity-related economies of the region? Um, the reason why commodity swings are so important is because it impacts consumption through the wealth effect, of course, if you have higher commodity prices or lower commodity prices, it makes a difference for the consumer in terms of the wealth effect it uh, uh, generates. Um, and for investment, it, has also, it is also very important because it affects the viability of new projects. If you believe that commodity prices will be lower for an extended period of time, of course, there are much less proje projects uh, uh, related to commodities that will be seen as viable. So for this small and open economies which are commodity related, you can have an important change in potential GDP growth because investment uh, reduces as a percent of GDP whenever you have a, a, a downward, the downward side of the cycle of commodities. Uh, in larger commodity exporting countries, especially in Brazil, the effect of commodities to the rest of the economy or the beyond the trade balance is less important for activity, for fiscal revenues because the country is larger. In the case of Brazil, it's a more closed economy as well. So it is more diluted, the effect, uh, than in the other economies of the region, um, especially if you compare with these small economies of the Andes. In Mexico, though I, I mentioned to you that it's mainly a country with a more of a manufacturing dynamics nowadays, it, commodities retain a significant impact on fiscal revenues. Uh, still, one of the reasons behind the, the recent fiscal reform in Mexico, by the way, was trying to reduce, to diversify the, 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 the revenues base, and this will reduce a little the importance of oil. Um, another reason why Latin is a diverse region, and before we go to, to more of the, the external uh, 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 part of the economy and the relationship with China, it's because there has been all, also uh, uh, developing, since the beginning of this decade in the region, I split between countries which, have, which are more open, more competitive, more orthodox countries in terms of policy. They happen to be more the countries which are in the Pacific coast. We're talking about Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico. And the other countries which are more in the Atlantic coast, which are more closed economies, they have been, in some cases, more heterodox in terms of economic policy. Uh, especially in Argentina, Venezuela, uh, they are also less competitive economies. These two groups of countries, which I have named in a past report, runners and walkers, uh, and a friend another day said both of the groups are growing less, so maybe you have to rename it, you know, walkers and crawlers. I didn't do that. But, uh, uh, in fact, when you look at the chart on your left side, you see that there has been a, a clear difference between the average growth of uh, the countries in the Pacific coast in red and the countries of the Atlantic coast in, in black, which has 
uh, developed since the beginning of the decade, and this is the gap. Uh, basically, what's happening with these countries that are more close, less competitive, and that have been pursuing less orthodox policies is that there is a clear, a more, a clear deterioration of the growth inflation trade-off in these countries. So when you look at the other chart, I think it's the most important chart of this, of this slide, of course, you have pairs of average growth and average inflation for these different countries of the Atlantic coast. You see that if you compare the red blocks, which are the average for these pairs in 2009, 2011, you compare them with this average for 2012, 2014, you typically have less growth and either the same inflation or higher inflation, okay? This is a situation economists don't like. In general, it tells you that you have lower potential GDP growth developing in these countries. Um, so, thinking about China, and this, let's focus on South America. Commodity prices, uh, terms of trade and growth. Commodity prices would not have been uh, in the levels they are now, not to mention the peak in 2011, if we didn't have uh, China helping. So there are two tables here showing academic papers or results of academic papers uh, um, on, on the impact of China on commodity prices, showing the, the China effect has been important to push them up. And the other is a chart uh, uh, based on long-term elasticity from another academic paper showing what is the estimated long-term elasticity of growth of the Latin countries to one percentage point change in Chinese growth. It can be very important for very open economies and commodity related like Chile, less for others, very low for Mexico. This captures everything, not only the effect through trade. Um, so the, 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 the Chinese growth over the last two decades has been very important through especially the channel of commodity prices for the South American region. Um, what happens now is that since the beginning of 2011, we see a, a reduction of the terms of deterioration of the terms of trade for the region. There is, uh, it's coincident with a lag to the peak of growth in China, which happened at the, the end of 2010 then you have a deceleration of growth in China, and commodity prices, they have come down. As a result, terms of trade have deteriorated for the region. This has generated what? This has generated a current account deterioration for the countries of the region. So Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Chile, these countries have current account deficits which are between 3 and 5%, most of them between 3 and 4% of GDP now. One important thing is that, the, that it's not only the commodity prices that are causing that. There is a loss of competitiveness that is very important, is also causing this current account deterioration. So the, the, there is problems with infrastructure, difficulties of the different governments in the region in order to spend more in infrastructure projects. Um, you have also, after many years of uh, with better growth um, and the support for consumption that I mentioned as a as a, 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 let's say, a result of the wealth effect, you also have the real wage growth in the region surpassing by far the growth in, in labor productivity. That's what you have in this chart on your left side, showing the excess of real wage growth over labor productivity it has been very strong in the region, but especially in Brazil, and that's no surprise that competitiveness in Brazil has reduced so much, and that growth in Brazil has reduced basically because of uh, a reduction in investment. Of course, appreciated exchange rates didn't help at all. Um, growth moderation seems more than just a cyclical uh, weakening. Uh, it has to do with the needs, the need of microeconomic improvements in the Latin region over the next years. Um, infrastructure uh, projects, education, less red tape, probably a better fiscal uh, uh, regime. Latin has been growing less than the average of world growth, uh, and as I mentioned to you, there has been an, imp an, improve, uh, an important uh, deterioration in uh, the uh, growth inflation trade-off. 
There has been an impressive increase in trade between China and Latin over the last 20 years, the last 10 years especially. Uh, Brazil now has uh, China as the largest partner, so does Chile, Peru, China is almost the most important for Argentina, and, uh, Arge and, and uh, Uruguay, um, China is the, the most important uh, um, non-Latin American partner. Brazil is the largest. So it has been a big improvement, especially if you look starting to 1995 and what happened up to 2013. It has been most in the expense of the U.S. Uh, of course, Mexico, being a manufacturing exporter, has increased imports from China much more than the exports to China. So the bilateral trade balance between Mexico and China is not in favor of Mexico, uh, uh, to say the least. Uh, but what to expect in a context of lower commodity prices? One important thing is to notice that the increase in commodity exports to China has been both quantities and prices. So it's not only, it's not that because prices are reducing, you will have a reduction in the share of China as a, a, a final destination of uh, LATAM exports. You have there the ratio of commodity prices has increased, but the, the total exports of these commodities over the last decade has increased even more. So there is a quantity effect, which is very important as well. Having said that, the pace of growth of exports to China should moderate, though the share should remain growing. So we have um, prices uh, falling. Um, what, we, what we expect in a trajectory, trajectory of Latin exports to China over the next years is that you start to, to have the growth on this share on a much more modest pace than what we have seen in the past 10 years especially, or I would say in the past decade, from the beginning of the 2000s up to 2010, 2011. These are some simulations we do for the long term on the expected trajectory of Latin exports to China and the US. Uh, basically, what are the, the, the assumptions we, we took here? Uh, we saw what was the pace of growth of exports to China over the last decade, and then divided by two, because this is not sustainable and kept the same for the U.S. Even with this reduction in the, in the pace of expansion, we believe China will overtake the U.S. as the most important destination for South American exports soon. Our calculation is to, for 2017. I published that like one year ago. When looking at the figures now, I believe that it could be even before that, maybe in 2016. And for Latin America as a whole, even considering the... the, the the weight of Mexico and the importance of the U.S. as a destination for Mexican exports, you could, you probably will have the situation that China and the U.S. will be more or less as important as a final destination for Latin American exports by 2030. So, uh, though the pace of growth is, growth is not as spectacular as it was uh, 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 in the past decade, it will keep being a very important one, and China will keep growing its importance on trade. Um, what will happen with the lower commodity prices? Effects in the region has to weaken, and we, because you have worse current account, uh, uh, current account results, this is uh, in our forecasts for most countries. Latin may be able to diversify a little the exports to China, maybe being able to export South America, especially some, some uh, uh, industrial goods at some point and to reduce a little the industrial goods uh, imports from China if you have more competitiveness allowed by a more depreciated currency. Um, another very important uh, change in the nature of the bilateral trade will be the growing importance of the renminbi denominated trade, which Paul will, will uh, uh, take a part of his presentation to explain our view. Financial ties and FDI have also been very important in the relationship of China with the region. Um, I would say that it started with uh, the obvious thing, China trying to, to buy stakes in companies in the region uh, in order to secure the, 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 the supply of raw materials. It has evolved to a more diversified setting with uh, also infrastructure. And lately, when you see uh, uh, the the a breakdown of uh, confirmed investments 
in 2012 and 2013 for Brazil, for instance, you see sectors like financial sector increasing, automotive, and so on. So it's a natural diversification, which has happened with the other countries that started their, their internationalization, the internationalization of their companies also in past decades, the US, Europe. In the case of China and LATAM, it has concentrated more for obvious reasons in, in uh, commodities in the beginning. Uh, so, I'll wrap up with this chart saying the following. Uh, there is an obvious symbiotic partnership between South America and China. Brazil is probably the most important country in this sense uh, on this commodity champion on one side and commodity hungry country on the other side. But it's more than that to come. Uh, the, the, the diversification of the relationship is already happening. Uh, for Latin America to be able to diversify more its exports, uh, it has to solve its own limitations related to the lack of competitiveness, uh, which is due to, to, to educational problems, sometimes red tape and so on. I guess that the reforms that already started in some places in, in Mexico, uh, some, some, some points in Colombia going, tell me that in the next 10 years the, the region will focus on that. Um, and I wanted to have a last word on the relationship between Mexico and China. It has always been seen as a relationship of a lot of a competition for the, the US market. Um, but this was more in a moment where China had costs which uh, have qualified it more as a competitor to, to, to Mexico. But China has grown so much uh, and, of course, wages go, goes up. Uh, there is a trend of appreciation of the currency, which can change from time to time, but as a trend, a long-term trend, that's what we saw, uh, to the point that the advantage that China used to have in terms of unit labor costs in dollars vis-a-vis -vis Mexico has reduced a lot, with Mexico having a very important logistics uh, uh, advantage in exporting to the U.S. So, my point is, Mexico may grow into a symbiotic partnership to China as well. Maybe not as symbiotic as with the, 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 the commodity exporting countries, but a more diverse relationship where companies, Chinese companies, start to establish in Mexico in order to take advantage from this platform of production, which at this point starts to become as competitive as China or could grow more competitive than China on the relationship or, or, or in order to achieve the, the American market. So I would not be surprised if it starts to happen in, in, the, in, the, in the next decade or so. I'll leave it here and pass to my, my colleague, Paul. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Paul? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the earlier introduction. It's nice to be back in Brazil. I was here a year ago uh, talking about the Remimbi, and I'm still telling a, a similar story in some ways, but what I've actually found in my, you know, being here only the last 48 hours is actually the knowledge base in terms of what people are thinking with regards to this currency has actually accelerated. Quite a big change just in the short space of one year. Now, we just heard from Andre talking about the importance of how Latin America and China's economy is actually becoming more interlinked. And I would imagine that over the coming years, you will start to see the renminbi being circulated a lot more between Latin America and China, especially in the form of trade. But before I talk about this idea of the renminbi being uh, internationalized or going more global, I want to spend just a brief amount of time talking about China's economic outlook and actually how this supports the renminbi internationalization process. So, growth. This year, there's been a lot of scare stories when we're thinking about China's growth outlook. Many people getting wrapped up in shadow banking problems, uh, whether China's economy can actually truly rebalance away from exports and more towards a consumption model. Lots of question marks. Perhaps it's not just 
been this year. It's also been in some of the more recent years as well. When we actually look at China's growth, again, over the last few years, the so-called black line on this chart would actually show a fair bit of stability. And this is very much our view. We think that actually China's economy is probably going to be fairly stable, at least through the course of this year and into next year. But that's quite important for my universe. Because when you actually have this growth stability, it helps foster internationalization of the renminbi, if not a broader set of financial market reforms. Because if you go through a situation that you had, say, in the early 2000s, going through the crisis, policymakers' attention in China was much more fixated with trying to support growth or cool growth rather than trying to deal with what they're going to do with their currency and to try and make it more international in nature. But when you actually have this stability, like I said, it provides a degree of comfort. And actually, that raises an important question that I've come across, again, over the last 48 hours being in Brazil. People saying to me, well, what do you think actually matters mo most to define the pace of internationalization of the renminbi? And I would actually say it's very much related to this chart. Again, if you have stability, comfort, maybe the quality of this growth could actually be better, but it's not falling apart, and it's actually not rising very aggressively either. And again, I think that this is very much conducive to policymakers' aims. And the same can also be said for inflation. Inflation, too, is actually relatively benign. When we're going back through the period from about 2002 up until uh, the Lehman's crisis, we could see that inflation was steadily rising. And at that time, what was also occurring, at least from my perspective, was that the way that the authorities were considering the currency was helping it to allow it to appreciate versus a broad range of currencies to help squeeze out inflation. It was an inflation-fighting tool. But again, now when you have inflation being relatively stable, they don't have to rely on that in the same way. So again, from the growth and inflation complex, we would argue that this is conducive to allowing greater currency reform. And again, that's exactly what we've seen over the last couple of years. And if this type of pattern continues, then I would imagine we'll see an acceleration of financial market reforms, if not also for the currency. Now, one question I've been often asked this year is that perhaps this growth and inflation mix is still a little soggy. Now, if you look at producer price inflation in China, it's, sorry, it's deflation, okay? It's not, maybe not the most uh, comforting story there overall. But however, the, going on to the question being asked, many people have suggested, well, does it make sense that China's authorities actually should seek a weaker renminbi to try and reflate its economy? And I'd say no. And the reason why is because that would complicate their ultimate policy goal or aim to internationalize the currency. If you're trying to, or being seen as actually purposely weakening your currency, that's potentially quite a, you know, um, a, a big drag on actually that story going forward. Then people start to lose faith in whether actually you're going to be so committed to internationalization. That doesn't mean that they necessarily want to keep the currency from going, you know, going stronger to stronger to stronger versus a broad range of currencies. They want to have a balance. They want to have equilibrium, not only on growth and inflation, but also being reflected to a certain degree in its currency. So again, when we think about the big picture macroeconomic backdrop, it's about stability. And as long as we have stability, then that will help foster the rise of the redback. That is, the renminbi going more global. And this has been a very much a, a key part of our focus ever since the crisis in 2008. Because since then, you could sense how the policymakers' aims were starting to shift. That they wanted to have the renminbi play a more dominant role in the global financial system than actually was before the crisis. And some of the, you know, the building blocks were falling into place to support that objective. Now, before I talk about some of those changes, we actually have to narrow the definition now down to exactly what has happened to the currency. 
And if you look at how the renminbi has been appreciating versus the US dollar, versus a basket of currencies, so the real effective exchange rate, it's been appreciating for some time. But the language that's actually used in China is that the renminbi is in a state of equilibrium. And again, that to me fits with the earlier remarks that I had said about growth and inflation being relatively stable. And same too is the currency. And again, that goes back to what I said as well about this degree of comfort to allow reform. If you have a situation where the macro back backdrop is too volatile, they're not going to feel comfortable. And same too with, say, inflow pressures into China. So back in the mid-2000s, you know, China's trade or current account surplus was banging up close to 10% of GDP. And if you combine that with a lot of the foreign direct investment coming into China, a lot of these flows were putting constant upward pressure on the currency. It was not the right time to try and seek liberalization because if you did that, then the next thing it would probably lead to even greater currency speculation and complicate the objectives for the authorities. So they wanted to have the right balance. And this is just one example. So as that trade position and current account position started to thin after the crisis, that to me was a part of the right backdrop to start to change what they wanted to do with the currency and to try and promote internationalization. But there's three pillars to this strategy. The first is actually trying to promote the renminbi through the trade channel, okay? Being, seeing it being used more to settle China's trade. And that's exactly what has happened. So pretty much since 2010, we've had a notable increase in the amount of China's trade being settled in RMB. Nearly 20% in the space of only four years. That's a dramatic shift. That is too big to ignore. And we consider the context of what Andre had been talking about earlier, about how the ties between Latin America and China are going to become more interconnected, then I would assume that at least from this perspective, the renminbi being used as a trade-oriented currency between these two well, countries, regions, is only set to increase. It's maybe perhaps quite small at the moment, but I imagine going forward, like I said, it will get bigger. So, shifting away from that, the other important pillar in, ter in terms of trying to promote renminbi internationalization is to see the currency used more as an investment currency. And that too is starting to happen, slowly but surely. The, pr the first pillar, as I said, was to see it used more to settle trade. And that, to me, has actually been quite successful so far. In terms of the investment currency story, it's happening, but you need more renminbi-denominated products. But what's actually pretty clear, if you look at the chart on the right, overseas direct investment, well, Chinese corporates are going shopping. They want to invest abroad. And part of the way that they're going to be financing that is through paying with renminbi. And again, this is going to be a story that's going to be accel accelerating going forward. The other avenue, of course, is through the portfolio channel. And what this chart here represents what we call the Q schemes. It is how foreign investors, you know, the type of um, administrative processes they've been using to actually access uh, portfolio investments within China. And it's been increasing slowly but surely. Perhaps not at the pace that some people would like to see, but it is happening. But also what you're going to see occurring even over the next couple of months is how Chinese investors are going to be increasing more through the portfolio channel into overseas securities. So there's a very exciting story actually developing between China and Hong Kong right now where their two stock exchanges are actually going to be connecting. That is so that the mainland investors will be able to buy securities in Hong Kong, in the stock market, and vice versa. And this, to me, is the beginning of something quite important because what it means is ultimately that many investors 
will be able to buy and sell Chinese securities over time. And then you will see the renminbi being used more as an investment currency, because if you want to buy Chinese equities in a more meaningful size than actually has been the case, and the authorities actually allow that, you will need to get your renminbi first. But then also, like I said, it's not about just encouraging inflow into China, it's also about encouraging outflow, where your Chinese investors will increasingly be allowed to tap uh, global equity markets. Now, moving away from that, we want to talk about the last pillar for the renminbi, and that is being used more as a reserve currency. And some people say, oh, Paul, I've heard this hokey-pokey stuff all the time, that the dollar as a reserve currency is going to go away, and then the renminbi is going to take its place. Now, I don't believe that, right? To actually see a, a big change in, in the reserve currency status uh, requires quite a significant amount of events. And you can just think about what happened to sterling and the UK, and when the dollar status actually started to rise, and the backdrop and history behind that change in relationship. But my point is, actually the renminbi being considered a reserve currency is actually already starting to happen. It may still be rather small in nature. I mean, you probably can't see the exact numbers on this slide so easily, but there's various central banks that are starting to invest in the renminbi as a reserve currency. And again, that makes sense when you're thinking about the amount of trade between these two countries and eventually greater investment between these two countries, that these respective central banks will start to accumulate more renminbi in their foreign exchange reserves. And it will only become a broader theme over time. It's not going to be an overnight process by any means. So when we look at the makeup of different reserve currencies, uh, this is the data provided by the IMF, you can see that the dollar portion of foreign exchange reserves is still substantial. You know, the, the renminbi wouldn't even register anywhere close to something like sterling or the Japanese yen. It'd be much smaller than that. But let's just say that we meet again a few years from now. I would imagine, actually, it's very possible that the renminbi portion of reserves could be closer to what's actually being held in some of these other currencies, sterling and the Japanese yen. So it will start to rise in terms of status of being considered a reserve currency. So I just want to make some final remarks. First of all, China's economy is stabilizing. And this is the comfortable backdrop that the authorities want to have to promote reforms, financial market reforms, currency reforms. It's not the easiest thing to do. Sometimes the focus actually has to shift back towards supporting growth. And we saw that earlier this year when growth was very soggy in the first quarter in China. The idea about liberalization, whether it's in the currency market or in the interest rate side of things, was pushed into the shadows. And then once growth started to stabilize, then the authorities went back to this reform type process. And I think exactly that's how this story is going to unfold ahead. And I also believe that the renminbi's usage in terms of the amount of cross-border trade and investment is going to accelerate further. Remember that nearly 20% of China's trade is already settled in renminbi from practically zero only four years ago. Again, in the years ahead, I expect that number to be substantially higher. I also expect the renminbi to become a lot more of a market-determined currency. So the intervention by the respective authorities will start to taper down. And again, we're already starting to see this relationship in a very short-term uh, time horizon over the last couple of months. And even though there's been various comments from the authorities supporting that, I do believe that when you get this outflow, whether to invest abroad, and inflows into, back into China, this capital account opening will actually lead to a more market-determined currency that, that, again, is comfortable for the authorities to actually accept. And I also mentioned the idea of aggressive reforms have already started, and that's not going to be slowing anytime soon. And the final point I'll make is how the renminbi, we believe, will actually be considered a convertible currency over the next few years. Somewhat of a controversial comment. Many people think that that's um, ridiculous. But actually, 
to meet some of the criteria that the IMF actually has for it to be considered a, a convertible currency, you know, China actually ticks a lot of those boxes. It's only a certain number that actually they have to meet in terms of the, I, in terms of the eyes of the IMF to say that it actually has a convertible currency. It's much closer than you may think. And on that note, it's always good to finish every presentation with disclosures and disclaimers, just in case I'm totally wrong, and this absolves me of any of that. Thank you very much. I would like to, do, to say the same. Same disclaimer. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, as a faculty of MIT, I would like to say that uh, I will also have to like to make a disclaimer. My opinions, their opinions do not reflect the opinions of HSBS, but my opinions do reflect the opinions of HSBS. <laughs> so, uh, I, um, I, I uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I want to um, ask you a couple of things. And um, uh, first, uh, uh, Andre, uh, um, what will you do differently in Brazil to prepare uh, for the shocks that are heading ahead? So if you were named right now the Ministry of Finance, uh, uh, where will you put your efforts right now uh, to prepare yourself uh, for that? On fiscal consolidation, clearly. Uh, there has been, I would say, in the last five years, a, a uh, with some some blips here and there, but a trend of uh, fiscal deterioration, um, partially because of uh, inadequate policies, other part because oh, the, 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 the environment was not as, as positive as in the last decade. In the last decade, we had a, a, a more positive external environment. We also had some one-offs happening in Brazil as, uh, let's say, the dividends of the macro stabilization uh, you had the higher uh, uh, penetration of credit, you have an increase in the formalization of jobs. All these things, they help increase the taxation base, um, and, and these were on up. So you, you came from a lower level to an adequate level, and also it's not re gonna repeat. So I think that after a very strong effort of fiscal consolidation Brazil did in from the mid-90s to 2000, and 5, 2006, I think we lost the grip a little and we need more of that. This will help in many senses in terms of the, 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 the ratings, cost of capital, also on, on inflation control, which is also another, another uh, dimension where there has been some deterioration over the last years. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, Paul, I, I, I want to ask you, it is a two-part question. I know that... Um, Assume you don't work for HSBC for the second. And so uh, when you say that the renminbi will be uh, inter internationally convertible, what is your time horizon? Uh, that would be my, my question. Is this three to five years, or this is 10 to 15 years, just a range, uh, if you can, uh, uh, what, what your views are there? And what are the boxes that are missing? So, so, uh, so is, is uh, flexible. So what, what are the boxes that are, that are missing? Sure. OK. Now the. The time horizon that we've actually been talking about is over the next two to three years in terms of reaching this so-called definition of convertibility. Now, that doesn't mean that the renminbi is going to be this wildly free-flowing currency like what you see for, uh, say, the euro or, or the Japanese yen at times versus the dollar. Uh, it will probably still have quite a bit of constrictions, or sorry, restrictions. And, um, but getting back to your second part of your question, what type of criteria still needs to be met that it's not convertible. It's a certain amount of uh, transactions for foreigners in money market instruments, uh, derivative instruments uh, within China. It's those uh, criteria that will have to change. Then it will move into a camp of being considered partially convertible. But then that is, again, getting closer to meeting the IMF's uh, criteria of having a convertible currency. So again, getting back to the point of you know, how close are they? I think you know it's only a couple of criteria that I just mentioned. It's a lot closer than people think. You know that in, in uh, one of the most influential papers uh, in academia uh, that Carmen Reinhardt wrote with uh, Graciela Kaminsky, she finds that the best predictor of a financial crisis is a capital account opening. No, so uh, so the fact that you make it 
really convertible is um, uh, is uh, creates tremendous uh, shakedown in the financial system inside, and usually you end up with a financial crisis. And in fact, it's usually two years after that. So, uh, uh, given what you have just said, how will you prepare China uh, uh, for that event? So, so we negate uh, Carmen's uh, uh, paper. Well, yes, I do. Uh, just to be clear, um, <laughs> but no, it's 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 a good point. It's a very good question, and I think this is why China's policymakers actually proceed with caution, because they know what has happened in the past, and they want to avoid that, right? And 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 again, it goes back to some of the points that I was making about having the right amount of comfort with growth and inflation, and proceeding with certain amounts of uh, capital account openness. If it turns into a situation that is not comfortable with them, then they step back from the reform process. But I think that they're on this path, they're on this journey, they remain committed to it. I think it's a time frame that makes sense to us, but you know, I don't think that they'll have a crisis per se because I think they're very good at actually managing the situation if they need to. And that's many, you know, many people outside of China, you know, they have a very pessimistic view, right? And this is you know, one example. And I think from time to time again, that pessimism has just not turned out to be valid. Well, the, the, my pessimism was not particular to China. No, it was yours, particular but... to any capital account opening. But so, um, but so now moving to pessimism in Bra No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it, going back a little bit uh, uh, to, to Latin America, and, uh, uh, and it's interesting how you describe the countries. That was the way I describe the countries, the countries that are in the Pacific, Look completely different to the countries that are uh, uh, purely on the Atlantic, and um, and, uh, and in fact, I actually use the exact same uh, division. It, what I asked this morning, uh, macroeconomists, what they think about the political instability that might arise on countries like Venezuela and Argentina, and their impact that that might have in the region. I would like to ask someone from the uh, practitioner uh, the exact same question. So. Uh, the clear turmoil that will come in Argentina and Venezuela, how will that, how do you see that playing out in the region? Well, the, I think there are two, two, two dimensions of that. One, one of that is if this model is not working as it was supposed to work, I think it's a good demonstration effect for the region. So the, the, the results are not what these regimes have claimed they would be. So this is good. You, you uh, were not watching the, the online uh, video, no? No. The, okay, no, just, just okay. to check. Okay. <laughs> so, the, the, this is not the, the results, the, they were not achieved. So, I think that as a demonstration effect, this is a good thing to warn the other, the other countries that uh, these shortcuts may be short-lived. Um, in terms of contagion, um, you always can have contagion. Uh, Venezuela, for instance, uh, is a country that has, despite all the volatility and so on, they have a very important weight on the, the bond index. So you go and talk to institutional investors, there are funds on some institutional investors which are funds uh, uh, that take more risk. Of course, they are sold properly as, as risky funds, and they have an important participation of countries like Venezuela in their portfolios. So if you have an aggravation of problems, and at some point people think there could be a credit event, you could have contagion. Of course, you have like classes, within the asset classes, classes of, of, yep. of markets. Um, so it should not affect the, the, the best ones, but in a way it has some effect. Um, and you also have effects which are not through, through markets, but through the real economy. So what's happening in Argentina now with the problem with the with uh, the discussion with the holdouts. This is affecting the economy. This affects Brazil directly. So part of the weakness of the GDP in the first half in Brazil can be attributed to an impact on the Brazilian industry, which has been material. So just to give you a figure, um, the Ar Argentina is the, the third largest destiny of Brazilian exports. China, US, and Argentina. 8% of total exports go to Argentina. It's mainly industrial goods because we are within the Mercosur, and it's mainly auto industry related. So cars in Argentina, the sales of cars in Argentina fell 30% year over year in January, June. So this has had a big effect in the Brazilian industry. I see. So, uh, I remind the audience that if you have any questions, please raise your hand. There are microphones uh, uh, around. So if you by any chance have a question, 
and let me know, um, and, and I'll, I'll point to you. Um, it, it is, um, I, I want to ask a question, with whom is Venezuela uh, partnered with? So when you have these asset classes and asset classes, what would be the typical country that you will match with Venezuela? Argentina, uh, Ukraine, uh, those are the three, the three largest weights. I would say there should be other ones that uh, my uh, FI strategist would tell me, but the ones that come to my mind. But those will be the, the, the countries. So those th those is where you expect the financial what contagion we call to take place. High beta. They well, do. but even the countries that are in other parts of the asset class, they may suffer a little. A little bit. No, a I little understand. bit. The other ones, of course, suffer more. And and, and are they uh, are the individuals uh, uh, very leveraged? Uh, so the margin calls will actually hit them significantly. I don't think so. No, you don't think so. Doesn't look like. Okay. You, you. Oh, no, I, I was just smiling at the, the language of high beta. It's yes. very diplomatic. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Latin America. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes. <laughs> How will you call them? Uh, high beta. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In my classes, I call them the countries that suck. <laughs> so we call it maybe, the maybe. high... Yeah, we call them high S's. Anyway. <laughs> so... Uh, so um, uh, let me see if there's any question uh, from the audience. Yes. We only have two minutes, so. Thank you. In relation with the free trade zones in Shanghai, uh, what do you think about the role of the free trade zones uh, in relation with the renminbi currency possibility uh, that's uh, it's an incredibly significant development so basically what's happening is that within this part of shanghai uh, the so-called shanghai free trade zone the renminbi will circulate as a convertible currency within that zone and essentially it will function and move like a free fl floating renminbi uh, that what we actually see in the offshore market so it's very very significant now, it's starting in a very small part of uh, China, and that's the typical uh, story when you're uh, so-called working with a pilot scheme. And then when the authorities start to feel comfortable with it, then they start to roll it out to other cities or expand it uh, in Shanghai. And then you start to connect all these different free trade zones within China, and it helps promote even uh, more what I was saying earlier about this idea about uh, the renminbi becoming a convertible currency over the next couple of years. So it is an incredibly significant development to consider. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, run out of time, and I want to thank uh, both of you, Andre and Paul, for coming, and HSBC for the tremendous support that, uh, that you have given us to, to this conference. Thank you so much for your uh, time. I know you are very busy, so we really appreciate uh, you coming here, and, and please uh, let's thank our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we, uh, we are scheduled for a 15-minute break. We may actually try and keep it closer to 10 if we could uh, to try and catch up on our time. Um, so uh, once again, thank you uh, to HSBC and uh, to our speakers. Um, there was a lot of tweeting going on in the last hour, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> so thank you very much.